Good morning. Welcome to the regular monthly meeting of the Longmont Housing Authority for Tuesday, September 15th. Uh, we will start today with the call to order, which I guess that was just the call to order. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Olivia, if you wouldn't mind doing a roll call for us. Good morning. I am seeing Chairman Cameron Grant, Vice Chairman Tim Waters, Commissioners Harold Dominguez, Jean Christopher, Tom DeBee, Lauren Kelly, Arlene Zortman. We also have Karen Roney, Kathy Fedler, and Polly Christensen. Thank you. Uh, and this is a public meeting. So if there is anyone uh, watching the live stream that would like to be heard during the public invited to be heard portion of the meeting, which is item number five, you'll need to watch that live stream on the City of Longmont YouTube channel for instructions about how to call in and provide public comment at the appropriate times. Uh, we'll give instructions during the meeting and they'll also be displayed on the screen when it's time to call in to provide your comments. Uh, just as a reminder, your comments are limited to three minutes per person. So each speaker will be asked at the beginning to state their name and address for the record before proceeding with their comments and then we'll let you know when you hit your three minute limit. Also pretty important, please remember to mute the live stream when you're called on to speak. And, and that'll come up later in the agenda. We'll, we'll uh, let you know when that's happening. We're now moving on to item number two, agenda revisions and submission of documents. Are there any changes we have to the agenda or any additional documents? Seeing nobody wave their hands, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. I'd, have, I'd entertain a motion to approve today's agenda. So moved. Got a motion by Tim and a wave by Polly. And by, G actually, wave by Jean. We'll, we'll go with that. Any comments, Polly, did you wanna comment? You're still on mute, I believe. Would it be a legitation at time, you know, that word, just fix that. Could you, could you say that again, Paul? You were on mute for the very first part of that. Oh. I didn't pick it up. Okay, I'm sorry. Just uh, chain, correct the spelling on item 6B of the real <laughs> Yeah, just correct the word. I, yeah, the, I'll say when I started on this board, there were a lot of acronyms and words that I had to learn, but that's a new one to me. <laughs> yeah. um, so we'll, we'll correct that. Thank you. All right, we've got a motion and a second. All in favor of the approving the agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, we will move on to approval of the minutes. So since our last regular board meeting, we've had two meetings. We had a special joint meeting with the Longman Housing Development Corporation on August 13th. And then we had our regular meeting on August 18th. We actually had a special meeting after that that I think we'll approve those minutes um, next time. So you should all have received those draft minutes in your packet. I'd entertain a motion to approve both of those minutes. So moved. Moved by Tom. Second. Second. Second by Lauren. Okay. All in favor, wave your hand. Unanimously approved. So we will move on. So now we're at item five, which is public invited to be heard. Uh, so if there's anyone from the public watching, what you need to do is dial one eight three three five four eight zero two seven six. That's a toll free number, so don't worry about the long distance. When you're prompted, enter the meeting ID, which is 847 5548 9100. And those instructions should also be on your screen, including that phone number. Uh, when we're ready to hear public comment, we'll call on you to speak based upon the last three digits of your phone number. Again, each speaker must state their name and address for the record, and they'll be allowed three minutes to speak. And again, most importantly, remember to mute the live stream when you're called on to speak. So what we need to do now, because there is a delay between the uh, Zoom version of our, our chat, our conference, and 
the live stream, we're going to have a five-minute break, and then we'll come back. So it's 8.06 now, so we'll come back at 8.11 to see if we have anyone uh, queued up to call. Cameron, before we break? Yes, sir. The number you read is different than the number on the screen. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, and chair, someone... the number... Chair, the number on the screen is the toll-free number. The number you read is not. All right. So let's go back. And, and so the number on your screen, if you're listening and not on, on the screen, is one 888 My understanding is both of those numbers will work. And in either case, when you get in, you have to enter the meeting ID 847-5548-9100. Okay, we'll take a five minute break now. We will be back at 8.11 uh, to see if we have anyone queued up. Welcome back. It's 8 11. Uh, can someone who's monitoring the waiting room let me know if there is anyone uh, who is queued up to speak? Yes, Chair. We have one caller in our queue. And when everyone's back on camera, I will begin. Great. All right. We have one caller. 
your phone number ends in 187. I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you are. Can you please state yeah. your name and address for the record? You have three minutes. Yes, my name is Michelle Newman, and my address is 320 Homestead Parkway, Spring Creek Apartments, Longmont, Colorado, 80504. Um, I'm in Unit 119. And um, some of you have heard from me in the past. Many have not. I have been was silenced last year with a restraining order. Um, I won't go into that right now. My main concerns are the integrated partnership and a lot of the comments um, that have been made since the first of the year <clears throat> by Tim Waters and about getting a professional mediator to Spring Creek to handle the situation. Um, even upon Jillian Baldwin's um, departure, things have uh, changed minimally. Residents still feel like they're a prisoner of their apartments. And now Jillian has come back to haunt us again because all residents, especially the original residents who um, came into the apartments in 2016, signed an eight-page lease. We are now being forced by Tory Sanders to, when we renew, uh, recertify and renew our leases this year, to sign a 27 page lease that is on legal paper, small type, where residents are being called in after their recertification is approved to immediately sign. No discussion. This lease is a joke. I mean, it is not even legally written. It is, does not pertain to the type of housing we have. It is like a generic global lease, and it puts all the demands on the resident, the agent or LHA has no responsibility or accountability in this lease, and there's no recourse for residents if, if LHA actually or the agent does not abide by their end and obligations. And um, this needs to be rewritten and discussed. I don't know how many board members have seen this new lease that we are being instructed to sign um, and it's it's very concerning and I'm I'm to the point that I want to go month to month when I renew but then the problem is that they're going to probably jack up my, my rent because I'm month to month and with that in June last moment at the August meeting you mentioned that you have um, 80 uh, housing choice vouchers available to um, distribute to the the community I had submitted a 2018 housing choice voucher lottery entry form and I want to know um, what the likelihood is that I might be a candidate to receive one of those 80 um, housing choice vouchers especially if I go month to month and do not sign this new ridiculous lease that's being forced on the residents um, if that's is that my three minutes uh, I, can you hear me your we, we can hear you just fine. Thank you for your comments. Um, uh, I, I think, as you know, you've presented before, or spoken before, this is the opportunity for you to give us information, and it's not, there's not a lot of back and forth here. But I would suggest right. on your and, and, question that you call the, uh, the, the main line and, and discuss that with someone. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And was that our only caller today? Yes, Chair, that was it. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to item number 6A, which is review and approval of a final draft letter to the City of Longmont regarding the value of city services to the LHA. Um, we circulated a, a revised draft based upon some comments that we had at our special meeting a week ago. Hopefully you've all had a chance to review that and it's included in the packet. So this will be the the final draft, unless anyone wants to discuss it and suggest some revisions. Polly. Um, uh, I would suggest just one change. I think this is a, a, a good letter. I, I really do. I think you did a good job. Um, of summing up everything that was discussed. Uh, the word unpalatable, which I know Jean suggested, and I, uh, 
have a great deal of respect for Jean. But um, I would suggest changing it to a different word like uh, unaffordable. Unpalatable implies that they kind of have a choice and they don't really, and no rent increase is ever palatable, but uh, when I would just suggest a different word like unaffordable or um, steep or something like that, that's all. Great. So I, so I think to follow Robert's rules to, to get further into discussion or no, no discussion, we ought to have a motion to approve or a motion to approve with, with Polly's suggested change. If anyone wants to go that direction. I would motion to approve the letter with, with Polly's change. I, I agree with her um, assessment of that word. Okay, we have a motion from Lauren. And I'll second. Jean, or second from Arlene. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, do the same. No one opposed. We have motion carries. So we will finalize that letter and get that off to the city immediately for uh, inclusion in tonight's discussion. Real quick. Hey, Cam Cameron, I, I couldn't get mine off mute. I needed to recuse myself from that vote. That's what I was just about. <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, let's move on to item 6B, resolution 2020-13, which is a resolution approving the closing of various sources of funding for the redevelopment of, here we go, redevelopment and rehabilitation of Aston Meadows apartment. Uh, that resolution was circulated, uh, I think separately from the agenda, you should all have that. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve that. Arlene moves to approve. Can, can, well, I was wondering if I could ask a couple of questions. Absolutely, I, I think, I think uh, yeah, go ahead. Discussion would usually wait until we have a mo motion in a second, but uh, okay, go ahead. I'll wait, I'll wait. I'll move uh, approval of resolution 2020-13. Thank you. We have a motion and I didn't catch who that second was. Second. Second from Jean. All yeah. right. So now let's turn to discussion. Arlene, would you like to ask your questions? Well, because I'm fairly new at this and, uh, and some of this legalese is a little intimidating to me. I'm wondering if this is the project for the rehabilitation of Aspen Meadows apartments. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, so I understand the bond for $8 million. And then the all of the other um, amounts of money that are in here total up to a little bit over 6.6 .6 million. Is that in addition to or is that to uh, go against that bond? So in other words, are we, is it a $15 million funding we're doing here or what exactly is it? It's and about, <clears throat> okay. so it's, it's about some, half of that. <clears throat> so, yes, yeah, so some of those sources are going against um, the bond and some are not. So it's about a um, seven, eight million dollar project altogether because there's acquisition, transferring the property from one entity to the other, um, mm -hmm. con considered to be acquisition or a sale. So the value of the property and the land, and then about a five, just under $5 million um, renovation included okay. with that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification, because in some of our communication, we, we refer to the project as a $5 million rehab project. So it's helpful to understand that. Any other comments or questions? All right, seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And should I note, Harold, that you recused yourself from that one as well? Or did you just no. not wait, raise your hand? Oh, I'm raising my, I'm voting okay. for it. I'm having computer issues right now. <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, so we have unanimously approved. Thank you. Uh, let's move on now to item number seven, executive board member report. Sorry, it is, um, I'm having a world of hurt right now with um, my computer. Do you um, want to send it to me? The no, I'm not, I don't have a presentation. It's just, okay. it's, it's locking up on me. So it's um, doing some wonky stuff. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to update you all on in terms of the, the, the fire that we had at um, the lodge, um, everything seems to be um, coming back together. Um, as of last Friday, um, the team that 24 seven that came in for the rehab, um, they moved units 101 and 102. They were two of the last ones uh, that were in play. Um, they were allowed to move back in uh, they cleared the hallway. They still, um, I think they've moved the filter, but they still had a, a HEPA scrub, hair scrubber. Um, the one unit that um, is going to need to be open for a longer period of time is unit 201 in terms of where they had the uh, actual fire um, and they have to uh, move all of their contents out and they they have to uh, get those contents cleaned um, and so that we can go in and do the the smoke mitigation that you need to do in that unit um, but you know within about a week everything um, you know, we had to move out people uh, the following, I believe it was the following Monday, we were able to move some back in. And then Tuesday, we moved the bulk in. And then those last two units were the ones that were, I think, immediately below it where the water came in and it needed to have some additional um, drawing time. So the team did, you know, in, in terms of the amount of water that was in that facility and I guess our experience the last time this happened in terms of getting the remediation team in, they did a really good job of getting in there quickly and getting the drying equipment into the walls um, so that we could avoid any other potential uh, significant issues related to water damage. Um, Aaron, Kathy, did I miss anything on that one? I don't think so. Um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, <clears throat> update you all on, so obviously we have a number of um, vacant positions. We have been looking at the budget um, and, and what we can do and what we really wanted to um, focus on was um, putting in um, hiring positions where the rubber meets the road in terms of actually working within the various neighborhoods. So we're currently in the hiring process uh, for uh, two community managers. Um, and a maintenance tech. Um, as we indicated, we did get the proposals um, for the consultants and we're looking at the financials associated with that, um, specifically related to the finance, um, the housing choice vouchers and the Yardi proposals. Um, you know, the one thing I can say on the housing choice voucher piece, the number was um, significant um, in terms of when we talked about bringing someone in to give you a sense of what they were talking about, it was approximately, um, I think on the high end, it was $30,000 a month uh, for someone to come in and work on the housing choice vouchers. And I think the low end of that was what, around 20,000, Kathy Karen, um, in terms of the proposal. So the good news is for us, we think in terms of HCV and you know the staff that's there and the work that we've been doing, we have a better handle on it. So we may be able to look at just utilizing an hourly rate for training. Um, on the Yardy side, um, that's gonna be pretty important to us because as we look at the conversion into the financial system, what we've realized is that um, even though we've implemented Yardy, uh, there's still a reliance on the old HMS system in terms of getting data. So part of the Yardy consultant will be in moving data over completely from the HMS system um, to um, the Yardi system so we can have everything in one place. Um, not sure exactly why it was converted that way, but we need to get a full conversion over. In terms of the IT process, we've been working with our ETS group. Um, our goal is to have a cutover on October 18th where we can bring 
the housing authority over into the um, city's ETS side so we can have all the appropriate firewalls and security in place. Uh, you know, right now that's also going to be dependent on purchasing equipment. Most of the equipment's actually coming in. We did find out recently that um, a couple of pieces to the primary infrastructure, uh, the backbone infrastructure that you need for this is going, is potentially going to be delayed. So that may delay the cutover dump time. Uh, but really what we're dealing with at this point is um, as a product of COVID, um, especially in the technology world, Sometimes it just takes a lot of time to get equipment because they got behind in manufacturing. Um, if you have young kids or you have young grandchildren, the best example I will give you is that if you're looking for a Nintendo Switch, those things have been sold out forever because you can't, um, they just stopped making them during COVID. So um, our ETS folks are really gonna work through that and um, really try to push for that October 18th cutover. Uh, some things that we saw on the ETS side, um, and this is as much to update Kathy and Karen, I had to add some funds because the UPS that they had in place at the facilities um, wasn't adequate for the time you need to have backup for um, the phone lines. And, and so we're going to add a, a more robust backup that will keep power on to the technology. Uh, the funding for that, I'm going to talk to City Council tonight, um, but as we looked at the CARES funding that we have, um, we can utilize that based on our conversations with DOLA, um, and it's really all based on the impact of COVID and, and positioning the organization so they can work remotely in this type of world. But you all may know or may not know, they never were able to work remotely um, even when we really should have, uh, just because of the system that was in place. Um, and that started from computers to just the backbone infrastructure. So about um, now $92,000 is going to be what I'm going to go over with council in terms of what it takes to get the LHA system in, in order and shape. So A, it works, but B, more importantly, they can work more remotely and at the end of the day, the big impact on that's going to really be if, if we had a community manager that couldn't come into the facility, they could still work remotely and interact with people. Uh, they can't do that now. And so um, the good news is CARES funding comes into play um, and it lets us uh, deal with a significant issue that um, I think will really strengthen the, the organization. That includes new computers, monitors for everyone so they can actually have um, 2020 technology um, to use. The um, other thing um, that, that we're also working on, and uh, just to let you know, uh, based on the uh, public invited to be heard comments, um, I'm just, you know, we were going to try to get some more information and then communicate with the board, but since it came up, we, we were made aware of the um, lease issue last week. Um, we have been, um, they, uh, Kathy and Karen and Michelle, um, have been looking into this, this item. Uh, they've been briefing me on this issue, what it looks like. And um, we weren't aware that this lease was in play. But when we found out, um, it looks like, um, to, the, to the caller's point, Jillian was working with an outside, another uh, firm that specializes in leases. And they were drafting this lease. And, and so as we've been looking through this, I will let Karen jump in at this point on the report to kind of tell you where we are today and what we're seeing. Karen, do you want to jump in? Uh, thanks, Harold. Yeah, so, um, so, so we are, um, we are continuing to uh, meet. So the, um, so this new lease was used for the recertification of um, the Spring Creek residents. And, you know, what we understand is that um, a new lease does not have to be signed with recertifications. So, um, so we're going to be looking about at the option of pulling back that, uh, that particular lease for the folks who were recertified at Spring Creek. And we're taking another look at that, at, at that lease. 
um, you know, Michelle, who is working directly with the community managers, as Harold mentioned, indicated that um, that the lead is quite um, long. It's uh, eight point font. It is. Um, it's it's pretty. It's pretty different, I would say, from the lease that the residents have been used to. So, so I think uh, maybe in the attempt to strengthen some things that need to be strengthened in the lease, um, you, you know, we haven't seen it yet. But I would say maybe maybe we went a little overboard. So we're we're really um, we're taking another look at that and trying to come up with a, um, a, a a lease. And I think the interest was coming up with a standardized lease. For all of the properties, and um, so we're we're going to take another stab at that. But we are certainly aware that this lease document is um, <clears throat> is rather onerous, and you know we want to make sure that the the new lease has what it needs to have in that without being um, too onerous. So we're we're going to go go back on that one and um, and figure that out. Carol. Yep. Um, I, just for clarification, that lease isn't just for Spring Creek, it's for all the properties. Um, and I have got, I have received very similar complaints to the one we heard in public comment about that lease. So I'm glad to know you're working on it. Um, personally, I would like to see a copy of it because it seems um, way out of line, way out of line. Yeah, so um, we, we will get that to the board. Um, like I said, I think this hit us last Thursday or Friday, Karen? I think it was I think, Friday. <laughs> I think it was so, Friday that yeah. this, this hit us. Um, and so <clears throat> this is very similar to what we've talked about before. It seems like um, as we're moving along and trying to learn as much as we can, there's still things we don't know. Um, you know, I, I would put a question forward to the board in that um, I don't know what discussions you all had with this work because we know it goes back a while and I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing the answer. I think that there wasn't conversations on that. And so um, just so you all know, these are things that, that are going to probably pop, continue to pop and hit us as, as, as we're moving through this, but I definitely understand um, what people are communicating to us and their concerns and um, just let folks know that we're looking at it. We're, we're going to need a little bit of time as, as we assess this, you know, what's really going on, what the lease needs to look like. Um, obviously, you've heard from Karen. I know Karen and Michelle and the group met yesterday afternoon. Um, we're looking at it and um, hopefully within the near future, we'll, we'll have an answer in terms of what we can do, but we're going to move as quickly as we can on that one. Yeah, and I, yes. if I can add to that, so Gene is, Gene is correct. So we are yeah. looking at a standard lease for all properties. And so we started to roll this out for, um, for, the, for the properties uh, where leases do need to be um, updated. So, so anyhow, and I think the other challenge that we as staff are continuing to work on is that we have um, the, the good news is there's a lot of us that are involved in, in these efforts. The challenging is that sometimes um, we step over ourselves. So we are, you know, certainly working on our own internal coordination issues to help make sure that communications are clear um, and, and the direction is, is, is coordinated. So, so that's, that's good for us to continue to work on too. Yeah, and I think the piece on that that Karen and I actually talked about yesterday is before we, anything's done on a significant step, any significant change, uh, they need to make sure that they're communicating with me, Karen, and Kathy, so that so that we're on top of it versus just you know moving forward because sometimes things that may seem relatively benign are not, and we then end up spending a lot of time um, going around in a circle. So um, so we're also adjusting some operational components on this so that we're aware of these in the future. And Jean, yeah, thanks, because it actually was. Kathy? Oh, I just wanted to add, just so that we're very clear, <clears throat> even if we at research go back and just use the existing lease for right now for recertifications, there's likely to be addendums that will need to be signed because there are things missing from the current lease 
like the Violence Against Women's Act addendum and crime-free multi-housing addendum. So there will still be likely be paperwork that might need to be signed and addendums, um, but they should be able to be fully explained um, and only that paperwork then signed at, at recertifications until we get to a more comprehensive um, lease. Okay, and, and can I comment on that? Um, because Kathy, um, that's the, the usual process is for the VAWA and, and a couple of others that are signed every year. But the, the recertification, uh, the, the, um, the lease was a one page, simply referring to the original lease. So I'm assuming this 27 pager came out because they decided to change the lease. But for our purposes, I think one page will do it with the right dates on it and on the agenda that you mentioned. So um, that would get us over the bridge until we get this other lease straightened out. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I think also to Kathy's point, I want to be clear, I think what we know is the current lease doesn't uh, meet what we need and what we're supposed to have. So the lease will have to be changed. I think the question that we're going to look at, does it have to be converted into a 27 page lease or is there a, a more streamlined approach that we can get to accomplish what we need to? Um, so I want to be clear, the lease is going to change. Um, it needs to change in order to meet the, our compliance issues. It just needs to be done in a way that's more user friendly, I guess is the best way to say it. So we're, I just wanted to, to let you all know that we're, we're, we're moving down that road and, and it's likely you're going to hear these things again in the future because there's just certain things, obviously from this conversation, we just don't know. Uh, but what I can tell you, as soon as we find them, they're going to dig. We're going to dig into them and, and see what we can come up with. The other thing that I wanted to give uh, the board a heads up on, and um, we were working on this yesterday, so you didn't get your financial reports this month because we are um, now in the middle of getting ready for budget for the housing authority, um, which um, is a lot of work. Just so you know, um, I was not jumping into that until I could get the city's budget um, and everything presented to the council. We did that. So now we're starting to work on this. Uh, more importantly, uh, Tracy or Kendra and Kathy have been working on submitting uh, the budget uh, to HUD uh, for their, uh, that for the lodge in Hearthstone that's actually due today. Um, so they've been working feverishly on that. One of the things that we're also working on is a notice um, because it's a 202 property, correct, Kathy? 202? It's because it's a 202 property, what we're submitting in this budget request actually entails a, a rental increase that HUD will pay for. And so because of the HUD regulations, we have to put a notice to the uh, residents about this. And so they're working on that notice so that it can be very clear to say, we are submitting a budget request to HUD of which they will pay for the increase, um, but we have to notify you of a rental increase essentially is, is what it's saying. But in case you all get any calls, um, it really is, we're saying here are things we need to add to the budget for the lodge in Hearthstone um, so that HUD can tell us whether or not they will pay for those, those increases in the rent. Specifically, what we're looking at is that historically in that budget, there hasn't been any ongoing maintenance dollars. So we're including on, ongoing maintenance for things like the boiler, um, annual carpet cleaning, annual window cleaning. I mean, basic things that you need to do in a facility that have never been included in that budget. We've also included a support service function because, because it is a 202 property. We feel that there is the need for support services um, and that's been included in that. We think it's something we need um, actually more globally um, to all the facilities, but this is our first run at it with HUD. Um, and so we've, we've included that and we'll be sub submitting that this afternoon, but I just wanted to give you all a heads up if you hear anything it's a rental, it's a rent increase to HUD. 
not to the individuals, correct, Kathy? That's correct, <clears throat> for the 202s. For the 202s, Lodge and Hearthstone correct. is the one we're talking about in this middle. Um, I know <laughs> HUD closed that down for a while. I don't know how long it's been. Um, it's hard for us to tell. Uh, I don't know how long it's been since the housing authorities actually done something like this and asked HUD to pick up more based on the operations. Uh, one of the things that, because the budget also has to be public, one of the things that really ties into the technology piece that we're working on is um, that uh, as part of connecting the facilities into our ETS network, um, we're utilizing NextLight because that's the backbone for the city's network and so they have a plan to to bring it into the facilities. Um, we've also been in conversations in terms of creating a bulk rate um, for uh, phone and internet service of which we've included in this proposal to see if, if HUD will cover that cost um, because it is a t in this case, in this property, a 202 property, um, which gives us some different components. They could say yes or no. Typically what happens, we submit it, they come back to us and say, we'll do this, we won't do this, then we have to resubmit. But that's a process we're going through there. Um, Kendra did a phenomenal job really in identifying and working with um, everyone to identify what we probably should have had in this budget a long time ago in terms of the ongoing operating costs associated with those facilities. Um, so it is going to be different, but what we're trying to do is at least Hopefully they'll say yes, but if they don't, get it on their radar, get it on HUD's radar, um, so they know truly what the operating cost is for these facilities. Did I miss anything, Karen and Kathy? <clears throat> yeah, Harold, can I just add, um, just for information's sake, that 202 properties, um, the residents will not experience uh, a rent increase because right. their rent is based on their income. Um, and, and I appreciate the fact you're sensitive to that in the letter that you have to post. Um, just um, in, if you have to do capital letters in bold, your rent will not increase, what you pay will not increase uh, because that does create a lot of, a lot of um, uh, pushback. Yeah, it does. It's interesting because when you talk about the lease issue and the protocols we put in place, um, I, I could, we, Karen and Kathy and I could see the conversation via email. And it was one of those where we, we jumped in, I think all three of us at the same time very quickly and said, okay, stop. Let's make sure we get the, the yes. notice right. Yeah. Kathy and Kendra were on the phone with HUD. HUD was sending us sample notices that have been used in other properties to do that very thing because we didn't want to take something that could be really positive for the organization in those facilities um, and create something that would send us in another spin cycle. So great point, Gene. Yeah. yeah. And it is, if you, it's based on your income. So if you're paying 30% of your income, your 30% is going to stay the same, or if it's 50%, whatever that number is. Um, as, as we look at the budget, just to, um, I know Kathy had it as an item and I'm just gonna tee that up so we can move into the budget discussions. Um, the one thing I will say is um, we've started having some conversations and we had to free Kendra up to, to finish the, um, the broader, uh, to finish the Lodge and Hearthstone budget. You know, one of the things that you've heard me talk about is um, hiring positions where the rubber meets the road, making sure that we have people in positions that serve the residents. And, and what I will tell you in, in looking at the budget at this point is, um, and what you're likely to see, and I'll let Kathy talk, go into more detail on this, um, is, is that my look at the budget, when, when we look at the existing structure, and this gets into the sustainability piece, that I think um, our consultant was talking about and that we've been talking to you all about is that when you, you have a budget that is dominated by um, the salary in terms of dominated by an executive director and then also dominated by the chief financial officer, what that really does is pull the available resources away from really the positions that you need to have in place. 
um, adequately compensating community managers, you know, what is the benchmark for those positions, um, really getting in, uh, you know, eventually the accountants that you need in place to do the work. And so um, I will preface it, but before Kathy gets in, is that as we look at this, you, you will see, unless something changes drastically, a, a budget coming to you all um, without those two positions in it so we can use um, the revenue for other positions. And, and essentially, it's, um, how do I say this, it's less expensive for someone, for the three of us to jump in and do this than to hire a CFO and a CEO or executive director in some of these other positions. Um, so, so you will see a budget that's bringing that to bear. Did I miss anything on that, Kathy, Karen? <clears throat> no, I would just um, re or back up that point, I guess, with um, as we're moving into this budget process, we're finding um, anomalies um, in the financial system. Um, just to give an example, some things like double entering things because it didn't show up from one month to the next. So an expense was double entered. Um, so figuring all of that out and trying to back it out. So what we're facing is not having a very good picture overall. Uh, broadly, we have a good picture of the financial system, but <clears throat> um, the, the more specifics um, in property by property, not as good a picture as we would like in order to be able to do really good budgets. So probably what we're going to have to do while we're unraveling the rest and bringing in the consultant accountants to do some forensic accounting and trying to get um, Yardy um, reflecting what has actually happened um, and correcting journal entries, et cetera, is <clears throat> to prepare a budget. Um, and as Harold said, not having those higher level positions, but lower level positions so that we know that we can afford. So we have a budget that makes sense for now but maybe adjust it in six months or halfway through 2021, something like that, as we get to a better financial um, picture and know what we can really can do and, and can't do around that. So it's gonna be probably kind of a weird budget year, <laughs> I guess I would say um, this year as we move through each property. <clears throat> Some absolutely look better than others. Um, and so trying to figure out why that is. Some of it is because of the way they're set up. Some of it, like the suites, has got um, project-based vouchers attached to everyone. So there's a higher level of um, rent that's paid by HUD um, through that versus the other properties that don't have as many vouchers um, and it's all tenant um, paid rent. So it's gonna be um, inconsistent across properties. And I would imagine that at some point we're gonna to need to do budget readjustments in, in 2021. Um, but our goal is to have the best budgets that we can going into that period okay. um, for you guys to, to look at and um, feel comfortable approving. Um, but it is going to take a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah, and actually, and, and, and this is where you kind of see us moving in and out. Um, you know, this is something that, that, that I, like. I actually like to do budgeting. Um, that's kind of how I started out. Um, and so you'll probably see me a lot in this and the work that we're doing. Um, and it's as basic as, so a question that, I've, that I asked on the Friday when we met, there's certain properties that we see that have historically budgeted in a deficit. And so, you know, I want to, why did they always historically budget in a deficit? And, and, and it, it really is that forensic accounting piece that you have to come in with and go, so what's happened? Um, and, and so we're going to be working through all of those issues. Um, so in terms of the budget coming to you all, it's going to probably come in very late, but we want to make sure that, that we present the best budget that we can based on what we know and really understand what are the operating costs associated with the facilities and what do we need to do because um, Kathy's right, we're seeing double revenue entries, double expenditure entries. Um, we're, you know, in, in terms of staffing costs, it, it took us a little bit to untangle it because when we came into this, what we thought was budgeted and what 
um, and this in that number we gave you all, we had to do all of this work. So there may have been an accountant position that was vacant and budgeted, but at some point they created other positions um, and funded it with the accounting position, but didn't adjust the budget to show that the accounting position was unfunded and they utilized these positions. Um, and, and honestly, it looks to me like that's sort of been a historical trend. It's not anything new. Um, not to say that it was something that was new at Jillian. It looks like that has some, been something that has gone on for a while. And so it's really at this point of um, really rebuilding the budget foundation as well. At the same time, we're also going to look into to the benefit structure. So I've asked some questions. Um, we've got to really contact um, the, the health insurance broker because we know it's time to re-up that. But we're trying to evaluate what's the cost of benefits on this side versus what's the cost of benefits on the city side and what makes more sense. Does it make more sense to bring those positions over if it's a savings? We also have to put, put that in the framework of um, recruitment and retention um, in terms of the level of plans. So there is a lot of work that's going to go into this budget process. Some of the things, as I think I've indicated to you all, may lead us to certain conclusions faster than we have originally assumed. Um, but it's really going to be a numbers-based approach and a really pragmatic approach as we're moving through this. Harold, does that look at the budget um, at all call into question the numbers that we're telling council about tonight? No, I think we're good on those numbers because that's taken all of that into consideration. Okay. So that, that was work that we were doing before based on what we, we were trying to see what we had um, in terms of um, salary savings because if the CARES funding wasn't going to come through, then we were going to have to figure out how to pay for the technology and some of the other things. Um, and so that number is good, actually. And, and you'll see something similar in that as we move into the next budget cycle, because remember, I think you had um, in the CFO, I believe it was um, salary only was around 100,000, 110,000. Um, and then you had benefits on top of that. And then on the CEO, you had 150,000 and then benefits on top of that. So that's what we're not doing in order to make sure that some of these other things can be done. And, and so you'll see that start flowing through, but that's what we're working on now. Dr. Waters. Uh, thank you, Cameron. Uh, Harold, as you've described what will be uh, reflected in this budget and what won't, and kind of connected to Cameron's question about uh, the unspent, budgeted but unspent balances right for the for the rest of this year that puts LHA in a position to reimburse the city for some, probably not all, of the time and effort and expense the city is experiencing. Sounds to me like you're going to bring us a budget for 2021 that does not have uh, that capacity or does not have uh, money budgeted to cover that kind of executive service in 2021. So will, will that put LHA in the position in 2021 of not being able to reimburse the city for the kinds of services that you and Karen and Kathy and you know, well, I think that's, delivering this year? So I think that's part of where there's two conversations happening. Um, and so when we look at the budget, we know that you all are having that conversation and we know that the council is going to have that conversation. Um, that's information that will have to be pulled in so that we can create, so that we can finalize that. So that's going to be a little bit of the lag too that we have to wait on. Um, it's, we're not, I don't think we're going to need all of the funds to hire the positions. But what we're, we're doing right now is we've got to work through that. We're just not at that point. I just know that in terms of if there were, was a thought of rehiring and an executive director that only did that um, don't have that fi financial capability. If we were going to look at rehiring a CFO that would only do that, we don't have that financial capability. 
Yeah, I get that. Really and I, the and message. I, I think you're. I think you've been clear that. Uh, and I think I think as you talked about the hybrid model and giving us 18 months to make a decision in terms of what the relationships look like and what staffing looks like, um, you know, you, you wouldn't expect to see that. But but in terms of sustaining even this relationship into 2021, um, you know, I just uh, I'm one LHA board member who thinks we ought to make certain that in the interest of sustainability, we have to build it out so that the so that LIJ probably not to the level of value, but at least as a way to transact with the city, some kind of reimbursement for what you and Kathy and Karen and others bring. And I would say one more thing. Uh, uh, Kathy used the word weird. She struggled for words. Well, maybe it's weird. Kathy, it's been weird for as long as I've been on the update board. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's a noun or an adjective, but uh, maybe it's both in this case, but it's, it's always been weird. And it's getting weirder apparently as we go along. So I'm certain you'll get it straightened out. Yeah, and to be yeah, and I think to answer your question and to be clear on my point, what what I've got to look at, I have to look at in the budget is exactly what you said: is what are we doing, who's involved, and what does that look like, and how do we incorporate it, incorporate it in the budget for Kathy, Karen, and the others that are involved. Um, obviously, I will not. Um, put anything in there for me. That's for that's a different conversation for others. But for those that work under me, um, that I supervise, I have to bring that in as part of the budget conversation. Um, the good news. <clears throat> so we've 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 talked about a lot of issues. Um, and as, as we're, we're talking about budgets, what I did want to, to let you all know is um, I actually did have a, a good conversation with Darren at, at Fort Collins. Um, and this is not unusual. Um, they actually went through the same thing. Um, the, the piece that, um, and that was really good news for me is when he talked about what Fort Collins did, it, it almost mirrors exactly what we're doing and the way we did it. Um, so that's, that's good news, meaning we're, we're tracking in a way that another organization did. Fort Collins has eventually trans, transitioned into being one of the housing authorities that people really, when you go back to the mission statement we talked about, we want people to replicate our model in whatever we do. You know, they're really at that point. Um, now, it took a long time. Um, and, and the time frame they used was, it was about 10 years um, before it really got to where it needed to be. I saw Kathy's look. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it, the good news is, um, as I talked to, talk to Darren, and he and I are gonna meet again, um, it, we're, you know, we're moving in, in, I think, a really good direction. We're tackling the issues we need to. It looks like others that have been in this process. Um, the thing that we just need to say is uh, patience and uh, tenacity, I think, are going to be key for all of us as we continue to do this um, and, and understand that there will continue to be um, issues that pop up. Um, in the case of Fort Collins, um, they actually took that approach with the deputy director. They hired someone in that worked for Darren um, in this process in the lower level position. That person's actually the one running the organization now. Um, so wanted you all to know that what we're doing is not inconsistent. And the more I'm talking to my colleagues, we're starting to hear that um, we're actually moving in the same direction they did. <clears throat> and um, very similar to what I've seen in other communities I've worked in um, when I was a entry level management assistant and they had issues with their housing authority. It was sort of the same approach. So the good news is I think we're moving in the right path. Um, we just need to be patient. Karen, Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? Not specifically that, but the other good news is that um, the Briarwood Apartments um, now have full access to Nextlight. Um, we moved very quickly to, to get them because a couple of them have kiddos that needed to um, 
have that for their school, um, virtual school. So that was a, a quick turnaround by Next Light to get them access at the discounted um, rate. So they're pretty happy there, so. Um, they are moving to that point. They, they do have a plan um, to have access at all the facilities um, by the time the cutover has to take place for our facility. Um, <clears throat> and we are, when we have the opportunity financially, really trying to look at the concept of bulk rates um, for the facility, um, because we think that has a tremendous value. And to give you a sense of, of what we're hearing, I had an email from some, I think it may have been Michelle, where people are paying in aggregate up to like $150. Um, and, and so in our conversations with Next Light, based on um, why people are in um, the housing authority properties, we deem that as a, a qualifying factor for our um, reduced rate structure that we have in place, which is obviously a lower bandwidth, but what they would have to pick up if, if we're not in, if it were up to them as an individual, if they wanted the full MEG service, they only have to pick up potentially the dif difference in the rate structure, which is still less money. Um, if we can do a bulk rate, then it shifts it dramatically for them. But when you start layering the cost, it really is how do you impact their disposable income by um, providing these types of services. So nextlight has been a great partner in this. And this really is getting at when we talk about digital divide, the digital divide doesn't only exist in youth, in the youth of our community. We know that the digital divide also exists for our older adults. And so it really is an, a great partnership that we've been developing with them in terms of um, closing that gap as quickly as we can. And they've been really, really responsive in terms of getting into these facilities. I know that was a question the council asked. And so what, what we can say is hopefully uh, within a month or so, Kathy, we should have next slide in every one of the housing authority properties. You know, and I, I think the only thing that I would um, just echo is the need for patience and tenacity. So, um, you know, it is, it, 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 it's quite a journey. And as Harold mentioned, it you know could be a ten-year journey for some folks, but um, but you know we we are learning um, as city staff. We are learning right alongside um, the board, the housing authority staff, and um, and and the road can be a little rocky. And um, so you know we just ask for patience. We ask for input. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us when you hear things or you wonder what the heck is going on, um, you know, we invite that because it really is about persevering and getting to um, the future that we all want. But we, I think we just, you know, we talked about yesterday. Yesterday was a really was a difficult day. day. You know, it seems like everything that we touched went wrong. And so um, we will have those days and we also have days where it's a beautiful thing. And um, so, so certainly please continue to um, give us input, not hold back on what you're hearing or what questions that you have, and um, and we will do our best to work through that. But I think patience and tenacity, two good um, adjectives and things that we really need to continue to hang on to as we move forward. Uh, I'll, I'll come to Dr. Waters, but I do want to point out to Kathy and Karen that we will, from the board, give you a plaque when you get to your 10-year anniversary with LHA. So, um, we'll, we'll I was see. just going to ask if see, Karen just signed up for 10 years because I'm going <laughs> to sleep well tonight. If the answer is yes, we'll have to figure out where you're going to send that plaque. <laughs> um, were you just you were just going to tell me where to put it? I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think that's the, you know, not to, to dismiss, I mean, we have issues and we develop, you know, we've talked about adjusting protocols so we know what's going on in a, in a, in a different way. I, I can't underscore the, the work that's being done by everyone, you know, folks that have been with the Housing Authority that have remained to stay 
and just the fact, the perseverance that they have um, dealing, um, dealing with us um, because we do drive um, and, and they've done a phenomenal job at that. The work from the, the, the city team that's come into play is, has been, everybody's done phenomenal work. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I look at Kathy and Karen, I think we've talked about this. Darren and I talked about this. This is probably in our career, the hardest work, at least in my perspective, the hardest work that we've ever done in terms of trying to distill, understand, move. But at the same time, I will tell you, it's also in many ways, the most rewarding work um, that, I, that I have done in the sense that at the end of the day, our mission is to house people um, and, to take, and to take care of, help take care of those that most need it in our community. So while it's incredibly hard, it's incredibly rewarding. And so um, patience and tenacity because the reward is great um, is kind of how we're looking at this. Well, it is appreciated. Uh, sounds like we've wrapped up your report, Harold, is that correct? All right, well, let's move on to board comments and reports. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add or discuss today? No one. Uh, well, I will point out we, the council will be discussing us tonight. They discussed us a couple of weeks ago. Um, so tune in, it's liable to be uh, must see TV. Cameron, are you go you're going to be on there, right? I'll be on there. I'll, yeah, I'll you're scheduled. Connect with you, maybe offline to figure out what you want me to do, but uh, I'll, I'm available. Yeah, I think it's just you need to give your whatever the, the letter, the letter and, okay. and go over that with them. And Susan, I forgot to, yeah, yesterday was Monday. I forgot to tell you we need to invite Karen to this meeting. <laughs> Susan, since you're on. Um, Karen. Cameron. Cameron. Oh, Cameron. Cameron. He's already invited. I got an invite. Oh, perfect. Somebody took care of it. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, if there are no other comments or reports, uh, our next meeting will be October 20th. I don't ha see uh, a special meeting in our future, but we're the LHA, so that may happen. Um, Kathy, Kathy, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry. Another exciting thing, our um, AMA closing, loan closing is scheduled for September 23rd. So. I just realized it would be before y'all meet again. So yay, if that um, actually happens on that date or even close to that. And then we're also starting to schedule um, the uh, conversion uh, to permanent for um, Fall River as well. So that's probably a couple month process, but at least it's getting started. So yay. And then we have Element coming for the that's tax February. credit in February. And that's for the other property at the suites. Mm -hmm. So good things are happening. All right. Well, thank you all for your your uh, persistence and stamina. Um, we will talk again next month, and I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>